Boker Tov, everyone. As the images you just saw indicate, today is a particularly somber, sad, and serious day. We ask everyone at this time to please silence or turn off your phones so that they don't interrupt the program. This program was envisioned by your peers, and before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the hard work of Adi Ronan and Liana Katz, who directed the student-led choir that you'll be hearing from this morning, and of Adi Ronan, Tamar David, Asaf Gadassi, and Amit Ginsberg, who worked tirelessly to put this program together. I'd also like to thank Rabbi Yubin and Ms. Naftalevich for their guidance and assistance. I will call upon Adi to start the program. Hayom yom azikaron l'chale ma'achot Yisrael l'nifke'e pulot ha'eva. Today is yom azikaron, a day on which we, alongside Israeli and diaspora Jews, commemorate the loss of more than 23,000 citizens, men and women, who gave their lives in the course of their service in Sahal, and victims of terror, men, women, and children, who were killed by virtue of the fact that they lived in Eretz Yisrael. That number is hard to fathom, and even harder to personalize. Today, your, peer, your peers will introduce you to soldiers with whom they feel a connection. We hope that the stories they tell and the connections they feel will bring the number to life. I want to share one such story with you, which I hope will frame the way we are choosing to commemorate Yom Azikaron. Miriam Peretz lives in Givat Ev, a suburb of Yerushalayim. She is a mother of six, in 1998, her son Uriel was killed while serving in Lebanon. 12 years later, her son Eliraz was killed in Gaza. While we have focused on her family's story in the past, today I want to draw your attention to several lines from her eulogy for her son Eliraz. Anashim tovim ve'akarim, lo hekartem et Eliraz, chakachem batem hayom ki shamatem, ki yesh li bakasha elechem, Anachnu Amni Fla, Srifagdola, Pakta Hayom et Mishpachti, Umitoha Levo, Umitoha Ashan, Umitoha Ish, Ani Pona Elechem, Kru Bevakasha, Truna Achat Shobni, Achat, Besimo Tabachem, Se Hazikaron Har Oebeoter, Altiv Nilo Migdalim, Ani Lorotam Migdalim, Ani Tuchal Lichio Chaim Hashmautim, אני בטוחה שאם ניקח כולנו תכונה כזאת, אנחנו נהיה טובים יותר, איש לרעהו, איש לעמו. Good dear people, you do not know Eliraz. Some of you came today simply because you heard. I have a request from you. A massive fire has attacked my family today, but out of the flames, out of the smoke, and out of the fire, I turn to you. Take, please, one characteristic of my son, one, and integrate it into your lives. For this is the commemoration which is most befitting. Don't build him towers, I don't need towers. I need to live a meaningful life. I am certain that if all of us take on one, on one such characteristic, we will be better to one another, better to our nation. Today, as we learn about Ilan Gadasi from his nephew Asaf, Esther Callengold from Tamar David, and Avner Kvir Khazi from Ami Ginsberg, we will draw your attention both to the life of that individual and to a particular character trait of that individual. <laughs> התכונה שמאפיינת את אילן היא התחשבות באחרים וחוסר האנוכיות. My uncle Elan died when he was 25 years old. I did not have the pleasure of knowing him. Every year I go to Israel and every year I see his pictures, his bed, a map of the advance of his unit in the battle he died in, some rocks from the place of his death, and a big silence. I do not see him physically, but I still feel the impact he had on the rest of my family. Ilan was born in Rehovot, Israel in 1958, 
to Michal and Shaul Gadasi, my grandparents, brother of Aviram, Suri, my father, and Oren. He had an ordinary childhood, going to the Yitzchak Ben Tzvi Elementary School and then to the Aharon Katsir High School. In high school, Elon excelled in sciences and math. My uncle loved to go on hikes with his friends. He would bring his guitar, and once they found a nice, comfortable spot, they would sit down and sing together. He liked working the land and spent hours tending the garden and the trees at my grandfather's home, something that my father vividly remembers. Soccer was another hobby of Elon's. This hobby was shared by his brothers and many neighborhood friends as they gathered once a week, kids of all ages, to play a good soccer game. Like his peers, Elon joined the IDF at the age of 18, looking forward to serving his country. He served as a medic in the Naha Brigade, a combat unit which also actively supported Israel's Yishuvim. My uncle always found the time to help his family at times of need. During his first year of service, his mother, my grandmother, tragically died. Elon asked his commander to serve closer to home so he could be there for his father, my Saba, and his brothers. My father, who was 13 at the time, remembers Elon caring and supporting him throughout the following years. Following his military service, Elon decided to fulfill his childhood dream of becoming a building engineer in order to redesign his neighborhood, Marmarek. He applied and was accepted to the Technion in Haifa. On Sunday, June 6, 1982, Elon was studying for an exam he had to take later that day. This is when he received the Sav Shmone, which alerted him to join Battalion 931, his unit, in the war that had just begun. His unit was assigned to combat duty in Operation Shlomo Galil, later on to be known as the First Lebanon War. The war was launched in an attempt to halt PLO terrorists' ongoing attacks against Israel's northern region, the Galil. My uncle was conflicted and didn't know whether to take the exam and then join his unit or to skip the test altogether. He called his Abba, my Saba, who served for more than 20 years in the IDF as a soldier and an officer for advice. My Saba told him to take his test and to join up with the unit afterwards, and this is what he did. My uncle Ilan did not live to know his grade. After taking the test, he joined his unit in North Israel, from which they entered Lebanon. They moved swiftly through the eastern region towards Lebanon's Baca region, killing PLO terrorists and their collaborator, the Syrian army. On the morning of June 10th, Ilan wrote a postcard to his family back home. רק שאני מקווה שזה ייגמר מהר ונחזור הביתה. אז בינתיים להתראות. אילן. אילן. אסיר. June 10th, 1982. Shalom to all. How are you? Here all is okay. There is no reason to worry. Here in the far north, working hard, eating a lot of dust, but nothing is serious. I have nothing special to say, just that I hope that it will end fast and that we will come back home. So in the meantime, goodbye, Elon. That same day, two IDF airplanes were returning from a mission in central Lebanon attacking Syrian units. While flying back, they mistakenly identified the convoy that my uncle was in as a Syrian convoy, a tragic mistake. The pilots launched two attacks Ilan was critically wounded and shortly after died from his wounds. He was killed along with 23 other soldiers, an additional 100 soldiers were wounded, and 30 soldiers suffered from shell shock. Sadly, casualties of friendly fire are part of every war. My uncle Ilan's final words were, Tagidu le'aba sheli she'ani ohevoto. Tell my father that I love him. The choir will now sing Mia Dasha a song about the realities of life in the army and the longing for a different way of life. This song was one of my uncle's favorite songs.
שתצעק אחריי בקדימה התכונה, התכונה שמאפיינת את אסתר היא אימוץ. אסתר קלנגולד was born in 1925 in Whitechapel, London. She attended the North Collegiate School for Girls, where she was awarded a scholarship to Goldsmiths College, University of London, to study English, and graduated with a first class honors in 1946. A staunch Zionist, Esther made the decision to make Aliyah by herself as a 21-year-old after graduation. In Israel, Esther got a job as an English teacher in Jerusalem. The letters Esther wrote to her parents back in London reflected her frustration with the mistreatment of Jews by the British mandate, and it was this frustration that propelled her to enlist in the Haganah one year after moving to Israel. On top of her typical training and duties, Esther volunteered to join the small group of defenders of the small Jewish community in the old city of Jerusalem, a dangerous job to say the least. On May 19th of that year, the community was invaded by Arab forces with cannons, mortars, and machine guns. The Jewish quarter defenders had no rep weaponry, and many, including Esther, were forced to use homemade Sten guns. One week into the bloody battle, the Arab forces exploded a building while Esther was inside, shattering her spine. Esther was taken to the Jewish Quarter Infirmary, where she was severely disabled and in a lot of pain, but witnesses reported that Esther was optimistic and prayed often. But Esther did not have the benefits of the infirmary for long. The Arab forces soon attacked the infirmary, and she was evacuated to the floor of a monastery.
This Jewish hero died laying on the floor at the young age of 22. It was Shabbat, May 29th, 1948, at 5 p.m. The lack of morphine caused her unbearable agony, and witnesses recall her last words after being offered a cigarette. No, thank you. It's Shabbat. The last letter to her family was written six days before her death. These are Esther's words. Dear mommy, daddy, and everybody, if you get this at all, it will be, I suppose, typical of all my hurried, messy letters. I am writing it to beg of you that whatever may happen to me, you will make the effort to take in the spirit that I want and to understand that for myself, I have no regrets. We have had a bitter fight. I have tasted of Gehenna, but it has been worthwhile because I am quite convinced that the end will see a Jewish state and the realization of our longings. I shall be only, only one of many who fell in sacrifice, and I was urged to write this because one in particular was killed today and who meant a great deal to me. Because of the sorrow I felt, I want you to take it otherwise, to remember that we were soldiers and had the greatest and noblest cause to fight for. God is with us, I know, in his holy city, and I am proud and ready to pay that price it may cost us to reprieve it. Don't think I have taken unnecessary risks. That does not pay when manpower is short. I hope you may have a chance of meeting any of my co-fighters who survive if I do not, and that you will be pleased and not sad of how they talk of me. Please, please do not be sadder than you can help. I have lived my life fully if briefly, and I think that this is the best way, short and sweet. Very sweet it has been here in our own land. I hope you shall enjoy from Mimi and Asher the satisfaction you missed in me. Let it be without regrets, and then I too shall be happy. I am thinking of you all, every single one of you in the family, and am full of pleasure at the thought that you will one day, very soon I hope, come and enjoy the fruits of that for which we are fighting. Much, much love, be happy, and remember me in happiness. Shalom and Lehitra Ot, your loving Esther. The choir will now sing Et Priganech, a song that depicts the disbelief and hardship that the family experienced upon losing one to its own, one of its own in war.
התכונה שמאפיינת את אבנר היא שמחה. אבנר כפיר חזי, זיכרונו לברכה, was a son to Sarah and Zachariah Chazi. He was a brother to Avi, Tzuri, Mira, and Ohad. He loved his siblings and parents very much and was very close to all of them. Avnel was also my mom's boyfriend. When my mom was a junior in high school, she went on a class trip to Eilat. Avnel, who was 19 at the time, was the Melvin Neshek, the security guard who carried the weapon. For Avner, it was love at first sight. For my mom, it took a little bit of persuading, but she soon fell in love with him too. People say about Avner that no matter how good or how bad the day was, he always had a smile on his face and was always happy. Avner had a big heart and loved helping others around him. He knew how to listen to people and always knew the right words to use to make every situation better. He would volunteer for different things, and wherever he was, there was always happiness there. When Avner was drafted into the army in July 1996, it was obvious to him and his family that he was going to fight in a combat unit. He passed his basic training and his paramedic training and started serving in the north of Israel, which was the hardest area to serve since it was right near the border of Lebanon. By becoming a paramedic in the army, he was able to fulfill his dream of serving his country and continue to help others at the same time. Avner's commanders describe him as a humble and professional person. The commander-in-chief of Tzahal said about him, and I quote, Mefagdav shel Avner, mitarim oto k'adam tzanua v'kechovesh miktsoi b'yotel. He was a responsible and disciplined soldier. He always did his job with full dedication. When Avner got drafted into the army, my mom was really worried and scared because of all the things that could happen to him. But the more time passed, the easier it was for my mom. She got used to living with the stress and convinced herself that she couldn't spend every day of her life imagining, imagining worst case scenarios. At one point in Avner's service, he was assigned to accompany a group of soldiers as they made their way to and from Mutsav Bufo, which is inside of, which is inside of Lebanon. His job was to be there just in case of an emergency. One day, as he was traveling with his group to Mutsav Bufo, a rocket hit the jeep he was on. While other soldiers in the jeep were injured, Avner was the only one that got killed on the spot. Even though he was the medic of the group, his friends all tried to help save him, like he always did for them, but it was too late. Avner passed away on March 19, 1997, Yud Ba'dar Bet The very moment that the news reached my mom, her life, along with the lives of all Avner's family and friends, changed forever. Avner's mom said to everyone, Although Avner is missing in our family, his girlfriend Karen, who is still with us today, was and always will be a part of this family. My mom says the same thing about them, that although she lost the love of her life, she was and still is a part of an amazing family that will always be there for her no matter what. My name is Amit, which in Hebrew means friend, and I was named after Avner because he was my mom's very close friend. To this very day, Avner's family serves as another set of grandparents, uncles, aunts, and cousins. Whenever, whenever my family visits Israel, we spend time with Avner's family. The choir will now sing Le Ole Chayam. My mom says that this song perfectly explains what she felt after losing someone very close to her, and also the struggle she experienced with how to move forward. Avner's friends miss his laughter, his joy, joy of life, and his optimism. Yehi zichol baruch.
Tagili ech la tzoret hatma'ot Tagili eifu yeshulam acher lichyot Tagili lama ein emet sham hazayot Az lama linasot vileam shich achshav livkot Ms. Mandel was born in Toronto, Canada, the same year that the State of Israel was created. She met and married her husband, Dr. David Mandel, while at University of Toronto, where she graduated in 1970. Together, they had five children, a daughter, and then four sons. In 1987, they made Aliyah with their young family and settled in Alon Shvut. In Israel, Ms. Mandel dove into community life, volunteering in everything from English story hour to serving on the local administrative council. For 12 years, she also managed Judaica stores in Jerusalem and Gush Etzion. In April 2003, Daniel, their middle son, was killed by ar while arresting terrorists in Nablus. A charismatic young officer at, of 24, his life and death continues to influence and inspire many people. After this happened, Ms. Mandel felt the need for a change. From 2005 to 2012, she worked in high tech in Jerusalem and spent her nights performing for charity and speaking to groups about Zionism, overcoming adversity and life in Israel. She retired in 2012. A person who has seen much and done much, she has danced and performed at the very successful women's amateur theater group Raise Your Spirits in Gushatzion for over 10 years and Dames of the Dance for the past six years. 
The past six years, she has organized a group, Tzavet Daniel, to participate in the Jerusalem Marathon in her son's name. This group raises money for various Tzedakah projects. Their family has grown to include 10 wonderful grandchildren, and all the family is living both in Alon Shvu or Jerusalem. For the past 12 years, Ms. Mandel has spoken all around the world about Danielle and the significance of his life and death. Her ability to relate to people and her message of strength and overcoming adversity has a strong and memorable effect on all that hear her. It is my honor to call Ms. Mandel to the stage to share her story with us. Before I start, um, you at Beit here, the 12th grade, can I see who you are? Four years ago, for those of you who were in the middle school, the, uh, for the Yom Zikaron Tekes, uh, Daniel apparently was the major uh, person. Yossi Herskowitz uh, was a good friend of Daniel's and, and uh, brought, do anybody remember? Yeah. Uh, here we're talking about we're talking about traits. So um, I'd like to start by reading uh, something that Daniel's brother Gabriel uh, said at the funeral. You combine so many traits, which is why everyone admired you. A combination of infinite quiet and strength infinite love of humanity and true grit when it was needed, a gentle and pure worship of God, and uncompromising military professionalism. You had a unique spiritual power. You would come home from the army early on Friday and straight away sit down to play the bagpipes. I remember you telling me about your soldiers and about how you love them, how you love the Torah, and how you were zealous for the truth with no compromises. You had infinite honor of parents. You led a distinctive, great way of life. If there was one thing you hated, it was mediocrity. And that's what we have to learn from you. That greatness, that refusal to compromise, that was you. When Amanda asked me what trait would personify Daniel, I said the trait of never giving up, of finishing what he started. Um, when I finish talking, I'm going to tell you a story to demonstrate that. I'm one of 23,447 mothers that has lost a child in the defense of the state since its founding. I can't tell everyone's story, I can only tell my story, but I'm representing the Ethiopian mother and the Moroccan mother and all the mothers that can't speak English and didn't get invited to come to SAR. April 15, 2003, seven o'clock in the morning. It was Yud Gimel Benisan. Everybody knows what Yud Dalad Benisan is. There's a knock on my door. And I open the door. People don't come to your house at 7 in the morning. I open the door, and there's three army officers. And they walk us in, sit us down, and they say, are you the parents of, at which point you stop breathing, mother of Nicole, who was nine months pregnant, mother of Jonah, learned at Hebrew University where there had been a terror attack the summer before that had killed students in the cafeteria mother of, Gabriel, uh, of Daniel, who was an officer in the army, mother of, of Gabriel, who had just joined the army about a month previously, and the mother of a very wild teenager that I could have believed anything about. <clears throat> Are you the parents of Lieutenant Daniel Yaakov Mandel? He was killed this morning in Shrem. Vazel, that's it. From that moment, your life changes forever. I'd like to introduce Daniel to you before I talk to you about <clears throat> all these wonderful things that I'm going to tell you about. Strength, how to overcome adversity, how to live your life in a positive way. 
But first, I want you to see what a charming, talented, cute young son that I had. Can I ask you to turn on the movie? Daniel, I have a child that has a mother Israeli. He was born in the house and he said, My mother is in the house of Barak. He was in the house of Barak. He was born 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 in the house of Barak. הגיע אלינו ככה עם פירות כאלה, כיפה שחורה וככה טיפ טופ, לא, לא, לא הספקנו לעכל אותו והוא נהיה ככה איזה מנהיג כזה של השבט שכל דבר ככה עובר מתחתיו, חושב על מה שמיד מריץ אותו, כולנו אחריו הייתה בו את היכולת הזאת לעשות מה שהוא רוצה, לא בגלל שפחדו ממנו בעיקר בגלל שהוא באמת היה טוב במה שהוא עשה וסמכו עליו. בחור מאוד מקסים, שתמיד ידע לחייך כשצריך ולהשיג את מה שהוא צריך, מה שהוא רוצה. היינו תמיד פרלים וזה, כאילו בתפילה נגיד, אז בשבת שרים את שיר הכבוד, ואללה, כולם כבר מקבלים את הטליתות שלהם וזה, ו- ואז נגיד הייתי מתחיל לדבר עם מנדל, אז תמיד היה מצביע לי שיר הכבוד, לא סתם קוראים לזה שיר הכבוד. נכנסים ללילה השני. אייש, תאמין לי. אתה חושב שמהמקים שבוזים? זה שבוזים, זה שבוזים, זה הוא כל הזמן ככה סיפר לי על הצוות שלו בעצם, ש... אתה לא יודע איזה מדהים זה שניר לקחת צוות צעיר ו... ולראות אותם לוחמים, זה כמו אבא שלהם וזה, שזה כאילו אני לא הצלחתי לעשות, אני ישר לקחו אותי להיות מפקץ לוחמים וזה הדבר שהכי הייתי רוצה לעשות, מה שמנדל עשה. מוזר לדבר איתכם על תחושות הוריות, כי אני לא כזה וזה... זה לפני הזוהר שלי. אבל זה קורה, זה קורה, זה לראות... לראות חבורה של... לא יודע מה שמגיעים. אחד עם השטויות שלו, עם הבגרויות שלו, באמת לראות את החבר'ה היום, וואלה, גדולים, חסקים, גאים, בטוחים, לוחמים, קיצור, זה... שוב, אני לא לוקח מהרבה פה שום מקום באבא אימא. וזה היה לי דווקא ראשית שלי, זה מיוחד מאוד. אפילו שהוא השלישי במשפחה, הטקס הצבאי הראשונה שהלכתי היה כומתה של דניאל. הוא גם עכשיו עושה אותנו 
חלק ממשפחת השכול. ומעכשיו אנחנו לא עולים החדשים. עם הדם של דניאל אנחנו עכשיו הישראלים. I have a question to ask you. Perhaps the question is more relevant for the uh, older people in the room. Is there something in your life that means enough to you, that's important enough to you, that you're willing to die for it? Because for Daniel and the three young people you heard about this morning, and all the soldiers in the IDF, the state of Israel means enough to them, is important enough to them that they're willing to die for it. And they're not doing it just for themselves and their emas. And they're not even doing it for those that either by an accident of birth or by choice are living in Israel today. They're doing it for Jews all over the world. They're doing it so that you can have the lifestyle as a Jew that you want, to wear a kippah or not, to eat kosher food or not, to go to synagogue or not. They're doing it because they know and we know what happened when there wasn't a Jewish state. I want to briefly, briefly tell you, because my time here is short, that um, uh, I went to Poland. I went to Poland with the army. They take uh, members of the bereaved family on every, every flight. Who here has been to Poland? Okay. You'll go, I guess, in your year, in your, in your year after high school. I came out of there with a really, really strong impression. It didn't matter if you were smart. It didn't matter if you had a good voice. It didn't matter if you were brave, if you were rich, if you were beautiful, if you were strong. If you were Jewish and you lived in the wrong town, you were dead. If you were Jewish and you walked out of your house at the wrong time of day, you were dead. It didn't matter all the traits, these wonderful traits. It didn't matter. It just mattered if you were Jewish or not. People look at me and they say, Cheryl, maybe you should have stayed in Toronto. Nice doctor husband, nice Filipino housekeeper. Maybe if you would have stayed in Toronto, you still would have five children. You want to know what I answered them? Living in Israel is a privilege, as Esther said, is a privilege that's been denied to the Jews for over 2,000 years. And with that privilege comes a responsibility, a responsibility of defending the state. And with that responsibility comes a danger. But the more we are, the stronger we are, it's less likely that it's going to be my grandson who's going into the army in a few months, or your, your relatives in Israel, or my neighbors down the street. It's less likely. I want to tell you a quick Daniel story, beginning of one. Um, so they take in 20 guys, like, like say, a class here. And as you know from your class, some kids are smarter than others. Some kids are better behaved than others. Some kids are more physically fit than others. But they have to make them into a fighting machine. 
And so they slowly build up their abilities and at the same time they have to have perfect discipline. Nobody's cell phone can ring when you're in the middle of a mission. Nobody can start whistling or not, you know, not have his equipment up to date, you know, have his gun jam when you're in the middle of a mission. So the way they take this group of 20 kids, 20 random kids, like in your class, is uh, by slowly building them up and by punishments. So in other words, Danny would come a minute late uh, because he, he was a Dati soldier and wanted to do Birkat Amazon. Uh, Daniel's shoelaces wasn't tied. Daniel would smirk because he was often smarter than his teachers and almost always smarter than his officers. So he would smirk if he got, uh, if the officer said something stupid or he would disagree. So Daniel got a punishment. Anybody here in the room serving the IDF? Yefe, okay. So the punishment was push-ups, okay? He would go mental and Daniel would have to do push-ups. Now, he told me that he did the most push-ups of anybody in his squad. And, but actually, he developed really nice, broad shoulders. And he was quite proud of them. So, for those of you who've been, and to those of you who will go, look at the taxi driver, look at the waiter, look at the tour guide, look at the camp counselor. And if they've got nice shoulders, you can look at them and you can smile because you know how they got them. Um, before I close, I want to tell you two stories, okay? The first, the first story is, um, <clears throat> was told to me by two bereaved mothers almost immediately after Daniel was killed. I'm not sure what the basis of the story is, but it's a story I love. This lady, uh, her, her, her child died, her son died, and she was sad, and she cried, and she cried day and night, and she cried night and day, and she cried week after week, and she cried month after month, and she could not stop crying. She could not start to function. One night she has a dream, and in this dream, she goes down this long, dark corridor, and at the end of the corridor, there's a door, and she goes and she opens the door, and she's in a banquet hall. And the place is full of these gorgeous young people, like you guys. And they're learning Torah, and they're eating and drinking, and they're singing, and they're just having an amazing, amazing time. And they say, um, then in the corner she sees her son. She runs to her son, she throws her arms around him, and she says, Hamudi, I'm so glad to see you. And she can't stop giving him hugs and kisses. And she hugs him and kisses him and hugs him and kisses him, hugs him and kisses him. And then she says, wait a second, why are you here in the corner all by yourself? Why aren't you with the guys? Why aren't you, you know, with everybody? And he looks at her with this sad face and he says, Ima, how can I be happy when you're so miserable? I truly, truly believe that Daniel doesn't want me to be miserable. I truly, truly believe that Daniel doesn't want me to go around talking about him, but he can't have everything. What every person who has lost a loved one wants is that their loved one will not be forgotten. Into this day, you have four examples of wonderful, brave, young people. I'm gonna tell you one final story and then I'm gonna ask for two favors. Okay, the final story. So they train these soldiers. Daniel was in the best army unit. He was in the Pal Sarnacha. And uh, the end of the training, how do they celebrate? They do a 90 kilometer trek. Not like you guys when you go to Israel, do a trek, you know, with your water bottle in one hand and your telephone in the other, you know, for a few kilometers. 90 kilometers. 
They're carrying their weapon. They're carrying their ammunition. They're carrying their water. And they're going. And they want to be the fastest. I know here in this room, I'm sure you guys aren't competitive. But the Nachal soldiers wanted to be first. They wanted to be the fastest. And so they start off in the evening when it's cooler. And they're walking and singing. And everybody in the group, in addition to carrying their own equipment, they have another responsibility. So the guy in charge of communication, he's carrying the radio. The guy in charge of first aid, he's carrying the first aid kit. And they pick the strongest guy in the squad, and he carries a machine gun. Because a machine gun is another 25 pounds. So, some of you might have younger brothers or sisters. Maybe they weigh four or five kilos. You carry them and you say, Mom, this is he's too heavy. I can't take him anymore. 25 pounds, which is about just over 10 kilos, for 14 hours. Anyhow, a lot of injuries, machine gun carriers. The guy carrying the machine gun collapses right at the beginning. His knees give out. And Daniel being a well-brought-up Canadian, goes to his friend and puts out his hand. And the officer comes to him in the army. They called him Mendel, not, not Daniel and not Mendel. The officer comes to him and says, Mendel, kachatamag. Daniel, take the machine gun. Daniel wasn't particularly big or strong. If he was alive, I couldn't say that, but that would be fine. Um, he hadn't prepared, he hadn't trained for 18 months to carry the machine gun, but his commanding officer said, Mendel, kachatamag. Daniel, take the machine gun. So Daniel picked up the machine gun, put it on his back, and he went. And he set off with his friends, set off. And he went, and he went, and he went, and he went, and he went. He finished the 90 kilometers. He went to hospital. He was sick. But he finished. And why did he do it? He did it because his commanding officer said, Mendel, kachetamag. I, as a bereaved mother, I'm also on a trek. That trek is called life. And suddenly, in the middle of my trek, my commanding officer said, Mendel, kachetamag. I said, no, why me? I'm not good enough. I'm not strong enough. What do I know? But my commanding officer said, Mendel, kachetamag. Cheryl, take this burden. So like Daniel, I picked up this burden, and I'm carrying it. And I'll carry it till my dying day. And I'm trying to do it with as much love and respect and humor as I can. And I'm not doing it just for the love of my son, Daniel. I'm doing it for love of all of Am Israel. Now, I've got two requests. What I do uh, when I speak is I asked people to take on uh, a mitzvah in Daniel's schut. And usually I say, it doesn't matter what the mitzvah is, be nice to your kid brother, clean your room, help your mother. Uh, but I have been brought here by the One Family Fund, which is an organization that has helped me, that helps the bereaved families in Israel, that helps terror victims in Israel, in any way they need to be. So I would love it if you would go home and tell your parents about one family and what a wonderful organization. If you want in your classroom to take on a project, whatever. But think of Daniel and think of the three other soldiers that you heard about. Think of them take on a mitzvah, and what I say if Daniel is still causing there to be positive energy in the world. 
For me, that gives a bit of comfort, and I'm sure for the families that we heard about, if you think about them also today, it will also give a bit of comfort. Now, this isn't on the schedule, but I'm hoping that it's okay. Every person got a song. I want to leave you with the message, not to be afraid, not to think that Israel is a place of danger, not to think that Israel is hard. Amanda, can I ask the choir to come up and sing Geshur Tzarma Ot? That's the message I want you. That's the message I want you uh, to stay with. Kol ulam kolo, geshut sarma od, aval ikar, ha ikar, lo lefachet klal. Life is wonderful. You're going to have an amazing life full of light, and just never be afraid. It's no coincidence that Yom Ha'atzma'ut is the day after Yom Hazikaron. And I want to thank Ms. Mandel for illustrating for us how one makes that transition, how one focuses on the sorrow and also focuses on the joy. Today is Yom Hazikaron, as is written on your screen. L'chalalei marecho Yisrael ulenifka'ei pulo ta'iva. So far you've heard about four soldiers I want you to think for a second about who those soldiers were. Uncles, children, boyfriends, girlfriends. I want you to think about who you are. Uncles, aunts, kids, boyfriends, girlfriends. Think about what that loss means. And I also want to take a second to think about the past few months the victims of terror that we've lost in what has come to be called the Knife Intifada. We're now going to show you a brief video that summarizes the events of the past few months, that pays a little bit of tribute to the uncles, aunts, 
mothers, fathers, children, boyfriends, girlfriends, people, characters that we've lost, specifically since October. Our pledge to you today is that you think not only about the number, but about the individual, about some way that you can take one thing that you've learned about one person today and make that thing real in your life. Be a little extra happy or a little extra brave. Persevere a little more than usual. Think about the other before you think about yourself. And in that way, we can internalize the loss and we can perpetuate the memory of the chayalim that we heard about today. I focus your attention to the screen. It's our tradition here to light one candle, one candle to symbolize over 23,000 souls. I'd like to ask Mr. Gadassi if he would like to come forward. Mr. Gadassi is Asaf's father and Ilan's brother to light the candle in memory of the 23,000 plus that were lost.
After the candle is lit, we will now recite the Kel Malei Rachamim. I'm going to ask Rabbi Josh Rosenfeld, who has served in the IDF, following the Kel Malei Rachamim, we will say, and the Shira Malot, and we will conclude with Hatikva. Elmale Rachamim, Shochain Bam Romim, Hamitse, Minuchan Nechona, Kanfe Ashkina, Vimalot, Kidoshim, Torim, Vigiborim, Kizor Harakia, Mirim, Masirim, Linishmos, Hachayalim, Vachayalot, Shelzvag, and all Israel, Shenaflu, Bemilchamot, Israel, Bipulot, Agana. Tigma levitachon beit midutav kidam ubeit sherutam ulinishimot kol lochame amachtarot vechativot alochamim b'marachot ha'am vikilot hamodin habitachon b'mishtara shecharfu nasham namut akidush Hashem ubezrat elohei marachot Yisrael. Evilut kumata umavam dinal yula taret vira Elohim. Ulcholele shenir tzachu barret sumichut salabi de ameratzrim igrener terror. Bavur shan mit paladin badas karat nishmotehem. Began eden te minuchatam. Lachain balarachamim yastere meseiter kinafav liolamim. Vitzor bitzora chaimis nishmatam. Adonai hunachalatam. Vianu chamish shalom amishkavam. Viamdu ligor alam le kate se amin vinomar. Amen. Shilam alo resign el arim, ain ya vozri. Shilam alo resign el arim, ain ya vozri. Ezrimim adonai osesh varetz. Ayitain la moraglecha, al yanum shomrecha. Hine lo yanum veloishan shomer Israel. Adonai Shomrecha, now till Chal, Yad Yaminecha. Yamam Hashem Shlerakeka, Vearech, Balayla. Adonai Yishmarcha, Mikora, Yishmar, Ednaf Shecha. Adonai Yishmar Titcha, Baracha, Meata, Vead Olam. Mishaberach Avtenu, Avram Yitzchak Veyakov, Huliberech et Chaylei Tva Hagana al Yisrael van Cheik Achot Bitachon. Hamdim al Mishmar Etzenu, Vare Eloheinu, Migvu al Levanon, Vead mi Bar Mitzrayim, Umin Ayam Agadol, Ad Lavo Ha'aravau, Bekom Mokom Sheem Yabasha, Bavir Bayam. Iten Adonai, Eto Avenu, Hakamim Aleinu, Nigafim Lifnehem. Hakadosh Baruch Hu, Yishmor Vyatzil, Et Chaylenu, Mikol Tara Vetuka, Umikol Nagao Machala, Vishlach Bracha, Vhatzlacha, Vechom Asei Adayim. Yad ber sanenu tachtem vea trembe keter yishua ve teret nitzachon. Vikuyam behem akatuv. Ki adonai lo hechem hao lechem achem, li lachem, imoi vechem li yoshiet chem in omar, amen.
You may be seated for one more minute. If you look around the room, you might notice that many of your peers are wearing black or dark bottoms and white tops. It's the um, unofficial uniform for the day of Yom HaZikaron in an effort to preserve the memory of the day, the, not the awareness of the day, once you leave this auditorium. We encourage you to think of ways in which you can continue to think about the seriousness of the day throughout the day. Later on today, one of your classes will be paused. We will all rise to hear the siren, the siren that blasts in Israel in the middle of the day, the siren that causes people who are driving to put their cars into park and get out and stand up, the siren that focuses us for one more minute later in the day on what today is all about. In about 10 minutes, you have your first period class. You're dismissed. Please leave the auditorium in a way that's appropriate and befitting of the day. <laughs>